Chapter 2 I stood at attention in the night marshal's study, but I wasn't really there. I didn't look at shelves of books that reached up at the ceiling, the coat of arms and the fully functional shield framed with torches, the rich tapestries or any of the other luxuries that pronounced this a place of power. I just saw the disgust and hatred on my father's face. The guards hadn't laid a hand on me, but I could still feel my father's hand where he had struck me. He'd never struck me in anger before in my life. It felt like he'd killed me. Jason woke at the last when the guards carried me out of the room. We had time for one last look. I saw the guilt and worry on his face. Then I saw the heavy wooden doors that slammed shut between us. Jason's father, the Knight Marshal of Andinas, who had no need of trappings of power around him. He didn't raise his voice in the least, but he cut through my thoughts like a sword. Your father is gone, which is no surprise. He and his party left half an hour ago. You'll be interested to know that one of the king's messengers departed five minutes after your father. Five minutes ago, the king received an urgent heliograph summoning him to court. Would you like to estimate how long it takes for a horseman to reach the nearest heliograph tower from Andinus, Squire Cooper? Every page knew the answer. The Deacon Ridge heliograph tower is 20 minutes ride from Andinus, sir. Precisely, Squire. Whatever business summoned him from the day's festivities, it was fortunate that the king's party had been preparing to leave before his messenger left the fortress gates. So, we've spared, we're spared the most immediate crisis. The king couldn't be seen, seen attending a gathering that your father had shunned without causing tension with one of his most loyal dukes. Marshal Julian Arsenio leaned back in his chair. He was a solid man in his late forties, and he radiated power like no other man I knew. I looked at him and saw the, that man that had time and experience would make out of Jason. He had streaks of gray in his dark brown hair, and his beard was sprinkled with salt. He was thin and broad-shouldered, but no one would confuse that with weakness. Julian Arsenio looked as soft and yielding as a watermarked sword. The cynical amusement that Jason wore had been hammered into ruthless practicality in his father. Some men were past their prime at 45, but I had watched Julian Arsenio train against knights and squires day in and day out for a decade. He was, quite simply, the most formidable man that I had ever met. And I stood alone in a room with him when he knew I'd just screwed his son. At this moment, he scared me spitless. The marshal steepled his fingers and stared at me. I felt like a blacksmith's puzzle, the kind made of wrought iron that you either end up solving or smashing with a hammer through sheer frustration. I deliberately did not look at the Arsenio coat of arms on the shield behind him or at the two perfectly sharp swords mounted behind them. If Julian Arsenio wanted me dead when I was in full armor and armed while he was unarmed and naked as the day he was born, I would still ask for terms of surrender. I matched his gaze, partly because that was what he'd expect of a knight of Andinus, and partly because I didn't trust myself to look away. If I broke eye contact, I might start running and never stop. So, Squire Grey Mountain he spoke in perfectly controlled tones, but his words were still daggers. Grey Mountain was the name of any fatherless son from my duchy. Cooper was the name of the family I had just lost. Perhaps you have some brilliant solution to the national crisis you've perpetrated. I had to swallow twice before I could give him an audible response. So much. <clears throat> so much for the knightly image. It was just as well. My chances of knighthood at this point bore a striking resemblance to my chances of manifesting the spirit of St. Gavin himself. National crisis, sir? I have violated the code, I know that, but what happened last night was my fault. I'll take whatever punishment you deem fit, but it's hardly a national crisis. Jason's father raised an eyebrow at me. I had to keep myself from flinching. I have turned a blind eye to your dalliances with my son in the hopes that the two of you would eventually come to your senses and outgrow your foolish adolescent indulgences, but now you force my hand. If you can't figure out the political ramifications of Sir Jason's late night rendezvous with Squire Robert of Andinus, then perhaps it is best that we throw you out right now. 
The order exists to uphold law and preserve the peace between the duchies, a task which demands rather more political and legal acumen than you are currently displaying. Now, on your hope of tomorrow, answer my question. He delivered his ultimatum in the same tones he'd begun, but I had seen him wear that mask of impregnable calm in the middle of combat as well. He didn't need to shout. As soon as he called us by our ranks, the answer fell into place. Jason is a full knight, and I still haven't received the accolade. That means, by law, I was bound to obey him on pain of death when he was acting in his official capacities. But last night... Oh, St. Gavin's ghost. Last night he was assigned as the watchman for my vigil. He was on duty. I... My voice trailed off as the legal technicalities whirled in my head. The night marshal stepped in. If you're searching for the legal terms, might I suggest a few? We can start with dereliction of duty, conduct unbecoming of a knight, corruption of a subordinate, and let us not forget that the power of command he possessed made what happened between you a technical act of rape. That last word snapped my whirling thoughts into focus, and I forgot myself. I actually took a step towards the night marshal's desk. It wasn't rape, sir. I wanted him to. I mean, there were some things that not even in my craziest moments was I prepared to say to the father of the man I had. Oh, stars and saints preserve me. The night marshal's other eyebrow joined the first halfway up his forehead, and the intensity of his glare drove me back a step. Tell me, Squire Grey Mountain, do you for one instant believe that the legal charges leveled against my son by our political enemies will be affected one bit by what you wanted? They aren't going to care that you and Jason were eight months apart in age, that you've been lovers since the summer of your thirteenth year, saints, he even knew that, or that this is the first day you've been together since Jason's knighting. For one day, and one day only, you two had the imbalance of rank between you, and you managed to use that singular 24 hours to put the entire kingdom at risk. The kingdom, I sputtered. Jason meant the world to me, but that was too far, even now. Yes, Robert, I said the kingdom, and that is precisely what I meant. My enemies will use you to accuse my son of rape. Then they will push for the harshest penalty available. Since my son is technically guilty, they will be able to call for his execution. Something surged within me, and I leapt to Jason's defense when I was already abandoning my own. That's ridiculous. The code only preserves, prescribes that for the most aggravated cases, and... They won't be leveling the charges to see justice, Squire. They will force me into a corner. I will only have a handful of options left to me. If I had no heart at all, I could hand my only son over to them for their justice. Regardless of the personal effect upon my leadership, I would lose my, I would lose my chosen successor to Andinus. You have the brains, the skill, and the personality to lead, but you will be tainted by the open exposure of your sexual proclivities. So I have lost my second choice to succeed me when I retire. That revelation hit me like a horse's hoof to the face. I had known Julian Arsenio to shave the truth within a hair's breadth, but I'd never caught him in an outright lie. He had really considered me as a replacement, fit to lead the order when he retired, second to only to his own son? I hadn't known, hadn't dreamed. At my very best, I'd only wanted a chance to serve the kingdom at Jason's side. But it made sense. The permission for the ex-tutors, the combat training, everything Jason learned, I learned younger. Arsenio plowed right through my shock. Don't gape at me like some love-struck ox, Squire Robert. My son's bisexuality has not invalidated his reason or his judgment beyond the tragically obvious. If he had chosen anyone less honorable or capable than yourself, I would have cut this off years ago. But you were a good influence on Jason, and a true friend in your own way. You're a hopeless ideologue, but your idealism has helped counter the cynicism inevitable in a boy who grew up watching me maneuver to keep the kingdom whole for the past 20 years. You're also courageous, skilled, charismatic, and more of a leader than you realize, though you've always missed it hiding in Jason's shadow. I had hoped that when you two stopped fiddling each other like a tavern band, you would settle down to see each other through the real trials of life. 
I was grooming you to be his right-hand man, an idea that you have now turned into the most terrible of jokes. I would never have guessed that you would have failed him so terribly in his hour of vulnerability. So now I will choose lose my first and second choices to lead Andinus, and there is no clear third choice. Sir Zedekiah of uh, Montblanc is one of half a dozen who could lead, but the succession would not be clear, and Andinus would be weakened within him would be weakened within. Then, of course, I could pardon my son for a crime he has committed, technicality or not. That is well within my power to judge and enforce the code within the order. But think on the ramifications. If I did that, I could not punish you, and I would in effect be condoning your sexual relationships. For two hundred years, the best and brightest of the nobility, those who stood outside the inheritance, came to Andinus as you did, unwanted but too important to discard, and we have forged them into the backbone of the kingdom. There are no finer warriors in the realm. Our training, our warrior's art is unparalleled, and we work hard to maintain the advantage. But what noble mother will send her son to Andinus when we will permit their violation? Andinus remains conservative because we must have the support of the conservatives, and if we turn a blind eye to the inevitable adolescent pairings, well, we must have the support of the more religiously flexible right along with them. Everyone has known not to force the issue either way, and now you two pull this. He reached out and rested a hand on the globe that represented our best estimates of the world. His finger tapped on the kingdom of Salus. No matter what I choose, the knights of Andinus lose. You and Jason are two of the best and brightest we have seen in my lifetime. Now you've taken the potential to lead the kingdom and used it to start the flames that will burn the kingdom to the ground. He stood and scowled at me. I had hoped to see you at my son's side to lead the kingdom, and now I find myself wishing you had never come to Andinus, Robert of Grey Mountain. Now you will remain here while I go assure my son that you are well. It would be just my luck for him to try and start some sort of coup to rescue you and make some foolhardy escape. I will take your word that you will be waiting here upon my return. I managed a nod. He grunted. You are both such bright boys. I have no idea what it is about the two of you that makes you cancel each other's intellects out instead of combining them. Perhaps, when I return, you will have some sort of answer for me that I can't see, because for the life of me, I do not know how the Order will survive you. Julian Arsenio swept out of the room and closed the doors behind me, leaving me alone with my thoughts. He may as well have thrown me out the window, for the room spun and twisted around me, and I couldn't get the falling feeling out of my stomach, no matter how hard I clenched my muscles. I leaned forward on the edge of Marshall's desk just to stay upright. Marshall Julian's words rang in my head like struck shields. War, betrayal, rape, death, failure. They were terrible sounds against the backdrop of things I hadn't ever realized. Arsenio's compliments, his faith in me, they stretched out like broad golden plains of respect and possibilities. But now those plains stretched out on the far side of a bottomless chasm that cut me off from the future I hadn't known waited in store. I pictured myself at Jason's side, bright armored and wreathed in glory. Now the wreath withered in the hour I discovered it. I reached too soon and further than they would permit, so the golden vision shattered and tumbled into darkness in front of my mind's eye. Arsenio had known, had always known about Jason and me. All of our sneaking around had been little more than a joke. No, not a joke, because our sneaking around for all of those years had kept us from this moment, from the political consequences of our love. Love? Was that the word for the action between us that would result in the death of thousands or more? I didn't doubt for an instant that Julian's words were true. King Lucas Martinson was the weak son of a very great man. He wasn't corrupt or venal. There was nothing, no great evil about him, but that was in keeping with the rest of him. There was nothing great about him, good or, e good or evil. He would have done very well as the son of an earl or a lesser baron with a small town, for he was gentle, kind, and honest, completely unsuited for the political realities that threatened any kingdom with power. When King Marcus died, he left the country united, strong, with expanded borders and fresh markets. But King Lucas was bland, and not strong enough to take leadership of the kingdom. He passively did neither good nor evil, 
and the duchies took the bit in their mouths. For a decade or so, it looked like civil war or secession was inevitable. Young Julian Arsenio led an expansion of the Knights of Andinas to stand in the gap. He expanded the rights of passage and judgment for the order and won a great portion of the national, greater portion of the national tax. The knights had always fought side by side with the other orders, and as the duchies looked only after themselves, Andinas stood alone and still we held. We held against bandits, rebellion, and monsters, and when they were gone, Andinas still stood. For generations, the kingdom had looked to Andinas. They donated to our training and provisions as part of their faithful tithe. They cheered us on the streets, boarded our wandering knights in their homes. The order stood, and because the order stood when others would not, the kingdom would stand despite King Lucas's failures. Andinas was the keystone that held the arch, and I had taken a hammer to that keystone. I cracked it, and if it crumbled, the rest of the kingdom would fall along with it. Guilt wrenched at me. I did it. Arsenio had said as much. If I had only said no to Jason this one time, the one day our ranks were unequal, and I had always gone along with the friend who filled my life with light. But last night he'd needed me as much as I'd ever needed him, not needing my touch or my presence, but my courage and conviction. All I had to do was say no just this one night, and I had failed him. Yes, I said, and threw my family's honor in the fire. Yes, and made him a rapist in the eyes of the law. Not just that, but I cut the first tie and shirt of peace that I had wrenched off of a kingdom. I looked at the half-blank globe with its undiscovered lands, and Dinas at its heart. It wasn't the whole world, but it was my world, and I had thrown all of it into danger because I didn't say no. Anger rose up like a foundation under my shock and shame anger and determination. I was a Vandinus, and we held the kingdom's honor in our hand. There had to be some solution, some way out of this. The saints wouldn't allow the whole kingdom to fall because of me. I was a lesser son, not an heir, not a lord, just me. There had to be a way to keep some not knight from destroying everything I'd ever loved or fought for. I paced the room with clenched fists and racing thoughts. I'd faced challenges before. I had overcome them, no matter what. A knight of Andinus didn't quit. I'd find a solution to this. I had to. The Order needed me. Jason needed me. The Kingdom. Even my father and the family that rejected me needed me. I'd failed them once. I wouldn't do it again. Determination forged order out of my chaotic thoughts. My love for Jason, and yes, I did love him, drove me to find a way to protect him once again. I paced the study, not as a trapped animal looking for escape, but a rich hunter looking for the tracks of his prey. Marshal Julian's study was a rich library, and the stacks of books weren't useless. They were tools and weapons of a master warrior. Maps of every duchy were here, and every scrap of intelligence that could be plucked from every knight who returned from assignment went through here. If there was a solution anywhere, it was here. I just had to find it. I ran my fingers over the spines of history and law books. Those wouldn't help me. The law was perfectly clear about the abuse of authority within the order, and none of St. Bridget's followers could do anything about it. There were books here on every battle since St. Martin overthrew Tom the Usurper, but they wouldn't have what I needed. I wasn't facing an entirely different sort of battleground. Think, Robert think. I pored over the books. Five minutes became ten. Half an hour later, I leaned up against the marshal's desk and rubbed my hand over my face. Nothing. There was nothing in those books to help me. But I couldn't give up. Knights of Andinas were educated, faithful, we had begun as a religious order, after all, an order of scholar monks who learned to fight as an afterthought. The knight marshal's desk was a mountain of paperwork, open maps with notes upon them, piles of files thicker than my fist, and every sheet worth more than a laborer made in a morning. His desk always intimidated me, because for all the seeming chaos in his desk, I'd seen Julian Arsenio reach into the chaos and pull out the exact page he needed. The desk was as chaotic as the political and military realities the Knight Marshal faced in the Kingdom of Salus, 
and he mastered the desk with the same strength of mind and will that held the kingdom together. If he couldn't find a solution, who was I to think that I could? No, he'd said himself that I could have been fit to follow him. He didn't see me as less or incapable. Foolish, maybe, and I had no doubt that his fathering instincts screamed for him to beat me senseless for diddling his son, whether or not Jason was a leader there, as in all things. I stared across the desk at the night marshal's empty chair. His words echoed back to me. I find myself wishing you had never come to Andinas, Robert of Grey Mountain. He must have been thinking that before I even entered. I saw the register of Andinas open to one side of a pile of quartermaster's reports on White Cliff's militia program. The register of Andinas was an immense and expensive codex, a leather-bound book that chronicled the names and deeds of every warrior of Andinas, from the lowliest page to the knight marshal himself. Every page received a page upon his arrival, with his name and coat of arms, and the details of his life were filled in underneath. I flipped through the pages with their bright colored glosses and thought about the generations of knights represented there. Boys from a hundred years ago were entered here. I saw when they grew to manhood, became squires, and then received the accolade and became knights. Many more of these names rested with the saints than walked the earth. How many of them had reached out to their fellow warriors for companionship, as I had? How many, of, how many had found the self-control to turn away from that comfort for the sake of the order? Had they been wiser than I was? Had they seen the consequences that I ignored? What would they do if they were in my shoes? The silent pages did not answer. I flipped towards the blank, unruffled end of the register to the generations still alive within the citadel's walls. My own page waited to greet me. There was the black sword of Grey Mountain on a field of red. There was my name, Robert Cooper, seventh don son of David Cooper, tenth Duke of Grey Mountain. Here was my acceptance as a page on the 5th of September, 740. On October 38, 743, Robert Cooper became the squire of Sir Kenneth Martin. There were other notes, a commendation for valor fighting bandits by Sir Kenneth's side two years ago, and my second place in the summer's grand melee. There was room for my knighting and the, the accomplishments, the marriage I would never have, and the future I had killed this very night. That space will be filled with different details now. I wondered what squire would think what some squire would think, thumbing through the pages, then looking back at my record from the year 900, if the citadel was still st standing in the cradle of humanity. I shook off the unhelpful thought and kept browsing. The pages turned unevenly. The register had been printed blank, full of pages and heavy as an iron shield, but it had lost pages and weight over time. Life in Andinus was a hard one in many ways. There was no shame for the boy who found that he could not measure up to the standards or the most elite knightly order in the kingdom, or they could not bear life apart from their family, their homeland, some girl in the castle where they grew up. Other boys had to leave once fortune changed their fate. The centuries-old tradition demanded that Andinus only took noble sons with no inheritance, the second, third, and fourth-born children. The citadel of Andinus had to maintain its neutrality between the duchies. It was a twofold solution. No duke had the training of Andinus behind him, and Andinus's ranks did not contain threats to any ducal throne. If, through death or disinheritance, a warrior of Andinus became the heir, then he also must leave. The ban existed for those boys. It might bring shame to enter the citadel and fail, not a ju judgment from outside, inside the order, but from the outside. Out of kindness and, fi and service to our pursuit of peace, the Citadel had developed the ban. A boy who saw his fate or duty elsewhere wrote a letter to the Knight Marshal. When the Knight Marshal received it, that boy's presence in Andinas was erased. He had never been there, so no shame could follow him, with the, into the annals of history. He was free to seek his own path. Even his page in the registry was removed. No one, boy or man, could ever be forced to write his own ban. Anyone who attempted to ban another faced expulsion or imprisonment. The ban was a question of 
family honor and personal honor more than more important than death. I blinked. My finger ran down the smooth edge of a severed page where someone had cut out the record of a band squire among those who had come to Undinus two years after me. Had I known his face, heard him laugh, crossed his sword on the training ground? Did this silent anonymous boy that know that he'd just saved everything that I valued in life? Within Andinus's walls, those of us who remained never spoke again about the band. The order was our calling, and it was tradition with the force of law not to speak of anyone who had chosen otherwise. I hadn't honestly thought about the band in years. It was something used by pages, boys not yet men more than anything else. No one in my year or the nearest two had signed the band since I was 16, and it had been rare even then. Pages signed the band. But they, became, they came to Andinus at seven years of age. It was rare among adolescents, and almost unheard of among the squires who had struggled and bled for so many years to reach the middle rank. No knight could sign the ban. A full member of the order was asked to live and die upholding the honor of Andinus, the saint's faith, and the, uh, and the good of the kingdom with his life or death. There was no easy out for them but I hadn't taken the accolade. I was no knight. If I wrote a band before the trial, the knight marshal would have to accept it. I wouldn't be bound by the order's rules, and I had never legally been present in Andinus. There was no way that they could put Jason on trial when I had never existed. With no record, there was no trial, and then Andinus's enemies had no grasp. I sat at the knight marshal's own desk, unpardonable pride, but in a handful of minutes I was never here and had never done it. Reached for a paper and pen and saved the kingdom, even while I shouted for the guards. I didn't see Marshal Julian or Jason before I left. When I told the guard I'd written my ban, from that moment on I was something else, a sort of ghost. The Citadel would take some time for clerks to finish all the projects involved in erasing my records, clear my room, and take my shield down from the Great Hall. I felt the change in status that marked my victory like a 50 kilogram weight dropped from my shoulders. Marshal Arsenio sent a page I'd never met to collect the letter and led me to an unoccupied guest room. I was grateful for some quiet and privacy as I tried to sort out my thoughts. I'd been in love with Jason since we were 13 years old. He was my best friend, and I didn't realize how much it had weighed him on, on me to hide that until now, when I finally didn't have to. Jason, my father, Marshal Julian, and everyone, knew, and everyone knew about how I'd felt and what I'd done. They might not approve, but that was nothing I had any control over. An eight-year-old burden of secrecy had shattered off my shoulders and lay in pieces at my feet. I'd wanted for so long to be someone that mattered, to prove myself, to prove to myself that I could do something, just once in my life, that would benefit the kingdom. Oh, there was more to it. I wanted to honor my father and my mother's memory. I wanted to be a warrior of Andinus, like the ones in the books who took a stand and changed history. In my own mind, I'd done it. I knew that it was my own choices that brought on the crisis, but when the crisis came, I'd found a way out of it, not just for myself either. I'd found a way out that even the night marshal hadn't seen. And on the way out, I had other things to carry with me, other trophies of meaning that no one could take away from me. Jason Arsenio had chosen me, valued me, and loved me. He'd given himself to me and accepted me when the whole world hadn't. His father had seen a leader in me, a warrior, and a man who could lead the order one day. Julian Arsenio was no political fool, but the man famous for never lying had given me the greatest affirmation in the hour of my greatest shame, and I went over his words again and again, branding them on my mind to carry out as an invisible prize, as an invisible prize beyond any man's reach. I knew that I had lost as well. My home, my livelihood, my calling, my homeland, and my family were all gone. Sooner or later, the reality would come crashing down on me, but those wounds were razor sharp and numb. I didn't dig at them yet. They would come in time, with all the pain, grief, and tears, but there was no virtue in prying at wounds that hadn't begun to heal. I would be as strong as I could, and then I would be weak until I could be strong again. 
After this, I knew one thing. I hadn't given up, and I had found a way through, even when my whole world was on the line. I would survive this, and if I survived my ban, I would survive anything else life could throw at me, or die trying. Ten minutes later, another page, who couldn't have been more than twelve years old, came in, trying hard not to stagger under the gift of hospitality that Andinas kept in storage for a stranger. A large cloth duffel was nearly as big as the page himself, and he didn't really hide the grunt of relief when he set it down. He handed me a bundle of clothes and waited outside for me to change. I stripped off my vigil's white gown, much the worse for wear at this point, and pulled on the undergarments, loose pants, and large tunic provided for me. The clothes were heavy knit since winter was coming on. I smiled to myself as I tied the front flaps over either hip. The clothes fit like a grappler's gi, loose and comfortable, but strong enough to pick up all my weight in one handful without tearing. The clothes were a better quality than many peasants could afford, but they were cheaper than anything I'd worn in years. I pulled on steady le sturdy leather boots and a matching leather belt. I took a deep breath and reminded myself that I wasn't a duke's son or a warrior of Andinus. I was officially no one from nowhere. I'd better learn to be grateful for what I could get. I didn't have to open the duffel to know its contents. Andinus practiced hospitality, and anyone in the kingdom who had come to the citadel that had originally sheltered mankind on earth to claim sanctuary as their fundamental human right. It was a tradition, it was an older tradition, and most of the pilgrim's chambers were empty on any given day. But it was the place for someone who had no place in the order. Pages packed duffel bags as part, uh, to give as parting presents as the pilgrims left. The bag held a bedroll, some simple tools, a change of clothes, soap, and rations. I remembered myself at twelve, packing duffels as punishment for some bit of trouble or another. I used to wonder where each bag went and what sort of person would carry it off into the wide world outside. The duffel and the clothes were two of the ceremonial gifts to a pilgrim. The third was supposed to be a sturdy walking stick. Someone had replaced the walking stick with an ironwood training sword, the kind pages and squires across the kingdom used to train and spar. Smooth, polished wood, shaped like a knight's sword, with a simple round guard and a two-handed grip. The ironwood weapon was an expensive gift. Seasoned heartwood from an ironwood tree could withstand axe blows without breaking. In the hands of a trained warrior, this wooden weapon could be as deadly as any sword. I looked down at the unorthodox present. The pilgrim's duffel meant someone in the citadel wanted me gone, but the ironwood sword meant they didn't mean my harm by it. Who had made the substitution? Was it Jason, Sir Kenneth, or the knight marshal? In the end, it didn't matter. I folded my white vigil robe and placed it next to the duffel. I could probably take it with me, uh, but it felt wrong. I was banned. I had never been here, and it would feel like stealing if I took part of Andinus with me. It was time to go.